Good afternoon. Thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Tim Menezveta. I am a Cortex-M processor product manager at ARM. The topic of today's webinar is how to choose your Cortex-M processor. The webinar is intended to shed light on some of the common technologies present on all Cortex-M processor cores and to highlight the differences between them. At the end of this webinar, you should have a better understanding of which Cortex-M core would be more suitable for your next design project. The agenda for today's webinar is fairly straightforward. The first part will consist of aspects of the Cortex-M family that are common among all its members. First, starting with some history on the Thumb and Thumb2 instruction set. Then we'll look at register set and memory map of the Cortex-M processors. We will look at the memory protection unit and what value it brings, the nested vectored interrupt controller, the wake-up interrupt controller, and then the Cortex microcontroller software interface specification. The second half of the webinar will be about differences. Although all processors are upward binary compatible, we will look more closely at where the instruction set support differs. We will look at differences in each processor core feature set, and finally, we will show differences in performance when running some standard benchmarks. In the first part, we will look at the fundamental technology features of the Cortex-M processors. Because they are common to all Cortex-M, these fundamental technologies help strengthen the broad ecosystem of software, third-party intellectual property, and tools, making it easy for you to develop software and system based on the ARM Cortex-M. So let's look at the instruction set supported by all Cortex-M processors. But first, a bit of history. One of the more successful processor products from ARM is the ARM7 TDMI, which is a 32-bit processor used extensively in everything from early generation mobile phones to game consoles. Unlike traditional 32-bit processors at the time, the ARM7 supported two instruction sets one called the ARM instruction set with 32-bit instructions, and another called Thumb with exclusively 16-bit instructions. By allowing both instruction sets to be used, code density is greatly increased. The Thumb instruction set subsequently was enhanced in 2003 with the Thumb 2 instruction set that included several, several highly useful 32-bit instructions to achieve higher performance while maintaining the same high code density as the original thumb. All Cortex-M processors, Cortex-M0, M0+, Cortex-M3, Cortex-M4, and Cortex-M7 support the ARM Thumb 2 instruction set. So if you design a system using a microcontroller based on the Cortex-M0 Plus from vendor A, and you decide you needed more information for your system, it is easy for you to migrate your code to a microcontroller based on Cortex-M3, say, from vendor B. Instruction set compatibility is good, but what about the programming model? Well, the baseline programmer's model is also common across all Cortex-M processors, while there are some differences to enhance performance for the higher performing cores. The baseline programmer's model is very simple. There are a total of 16 32-bit registers. The last three have special usages. R13 is the stack pointer. Note that the stack pointer is banked. There is a main stack pointer and a process stack pointer. If you have a system that run, is running an operating system, the dual stack pointers allow keeping separate stacks for the operating system and the thread or the process stack. R14 is the link register, which stores the return address when making a function call. And R15 is the program counter. There are two execution modes on Cortex-M processors, one called thread mode, typically for normal program code, and handler mode, typically for the interrupt handlers. There are also two execution levels, privileged and unprivileged. 
Handler mode is always privileged, and thread can be either. The two execution levels provide a basic security usage model that prevents application running in unprivileged level to access privileged level code and resources. In addition to the 16 registers, there are a few special purpose registers. There are the program status registers that provide ALU flags and various process status information. There are also the pry mask, fault mask, and base pry registers that are used for exception or interrupt masking. And the control register, which defines the selection of stack pointer and access level in thread mode, privileged or unprivileged. Now let's look at the memory map. The 4 gigabyte linear memory space is common to all Cortex-M processors, and all locations are accessible by software. It is partitioned into a number of memory regions that are assigned to typical usage types. These include program code access, or the code region, data accesses, or the SRAM region, uh, peripherals, or the peripherals region, and the processor's internal control and debug components, or the systems region. An optional memory protection unit, or MPU, uh, is available uh, for the Cortex-M0+, M3, M4, and M7. And the MPU can be used to define memory access permissions uh, to various uh, memory ranges that are definable. A very compelling use case uh, of the MPU is to define privileged and unprivileged memory regions uh, for high reliability, high reliability systems. What I mean by that, uh, let's have a look at the next slide. So what I mean by providing uh, additional support for high reliability systems um, is that in multitasking environments, an operating system can be considered uh, to be executing in privileged level with its own stack pointer. If a stack overflow occurs during unprivileged code execution, memory regions of the uh, privileged OS space can be protected from the stack overflow and allow a fault exception handler to recover from the failure. The multiple regions of memory can be defined in the memory protection unit together with their address, size, attributes, and access permission. The memory protection unit is available on all Cortex-M processors except for the Cortex-M0. Another fundamental technology that is common among all Cortex-M processors and contributes to the ease of software migration from one Cortex-M processor to the next is the nested vectored interrupt controller, or NVIC. The NVIC enables fast interrupt response times by allowing, for example, tail chaining of interrupts, where a pending interrupt can be serviced right after a current interrupt service routine without the additional popping and pushing of registers. The NVIC handles automatically the saving and restoring of registers used by the interrupt service routine avoiding the need for assembly wrappers around ISRs for handling context switching. Interrupt service routines can thus be easily written in C. The NVIC also supports uh, a number of interrupt sources, including the programmable uh, interrupts, user programmable interrupts. So in addition to those, uh, the NVIC supports uh, a non-maskable interrupt, uh, system tick timer interrupt, and a number of uh, system exception interrupts. The NVIC has a number of programmable registers that you can use to set up priority levels for your interrupts and also to uh, enable and disable them. There are several built-in features common to all Cortex-M processors that contribute to energy efficiency. First, the processor itself integrates architectural clock gating, which allows designers to easily implement low power optimizations. 
Second, there are several instructions as well as programmable status bits that help both software and hardware designers optimize their system for low power. One example is the sleep on exit status, which enables the processor to enter sleep mode whenever all pending interrupts have been completely serviced. For systems with extreme energy efficiency requirements, certain parts, including the processor core itself, need to be power gated to reduce minimum leakage current. In these designs, the Cortex-M processor provides an external wake-up interrupt controller, or WIC, that can be powered while the whole system is in power down mode. When an event that requires processor handling occurs, the WIC then wakes up the rest of the system to resume operation. In these types of operating modes, state retention power gating is typically required, and all Cortex-M processors support state retention power gating. And finally, the ARM Cortex Microcontroller Software Interface Standard, or SIMSYS, is a vendor-independent hardware ex abstraction layer for the Cortex-M processor series. Productivity is one of the three main pillars of Cortex-M success as an embedded processor, and SIMSYS enables users' productivity by standardizing the sat software interfaces across all Cortex-M silicon vendor products. When creating new projects or migrating existing software to a new device, SIMSYS enables significant software development cost reductions. Specifically, SIMSYS enables consistent and simple software interfaces to the processor for interfacing peripherals, real-time operating systems, middleware, debuggers, and also DSP library functions. Many hardware and software tools vendors support SIMSYS, and this has been a major contributor to the strength of the Cortex-M ecosystem that supports its users. Now let's look at the differences between the Cortex-M processors. One of the key differences to highlight is the instruction set support. All Cortex-M processors are upwards binary compatible. Um, Let's first look at the Cortex-M0 and M0+. Plus. Uh, these cores have the smallest instruction set with just 56 instructions. Most of the instructions inside the green rectangle uh, are 16-bit wide, and only a couple or a few uh, are 32-bit wide. Cortex-M0 and M0+, Plus are champions at high code density, and they're generally very good at doing general data processing and IO control tasks. If your data processing requirements are more complex, then the Cortex-M3 or Cortex-M4 offer additional instructions that can prove to be useful. Uh, for example, the Cortex-M3, M4, and M7 have hardware divide instructions, they have bit field processing instructions, uh, they also have multiply accumulate instructions, and in general a, a richer set of instructions that enables fewer number of instructions for a given task. If your application is focused on digital signal processing, then uh, the single instruction multiple data capabilities of the Cortex-M4 and Cortex-M7 will probably uh, prove useful. We will highlight the differences between the DSP performance of Cortex-M4 and Cortex-M7 later on. Uh, in addition, uh, both the Cortex-M4 and Cortex-M7 support fast floating point operations. Uh, the Cortex-M4 uh, has an optional single precision floating point unit um, while the Cortex-M7, uh, there is the option to include either a single precision only or a single and double precision floating point unit. So once these floating point units are integrated, uh, the associated uh, floating point instructions are of course uh, supported. So let's look 
a bit more at the instruction set uh, comparison between the Cortex-M cores. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but uh, it is important to highlight the key differences. Um, single cycle multiply is available on all, all Cortex-M. Uh, hardware divide is only available to Cortex-M3, M4, and M7, as previously mentioned. Um, also, advanced uh, memory access instructions are available with M3, M4, and M7. This is mainly due to the fact that these higher-end cores uh, have multiple bus interfaces uh, to, to data memory space. In addition, uh, these higher-end cores, the M3, M4, M7, have more e extensive set of conditional execution instructions, uh, branch and compare and branch instructions. Also, it's a, they support uh, exclusive access instructions, which are useful when you have multiple masters sharing resources uh, on, on the same device. Uh, and, and there is um, a semaphore mechanism that is available to the software programmer. As far as DSP performance is concerned, um, Cortex M4 and M7 support uh, single instruction multiple data uh, DSP type instructions. And uh, the, the result of that is their DSP performance is markedly increased compared to Cortex M3 and the smaller cores. Saturation arithmetic is also available uh, on Cortex-M4 and Cortex-M7. And finally, floating point uh, operation is available on Cortex-M4 and Cortex-M7. Now let's look at the system feature differences. Most of the commonly used system features are available in all Cortex-M processors, sleep modes, as well as the wake-up interrupt controller. Um, also, the state retention power gating support is available and enables silicon designers to implement very low power designs. For example, it is possible to put the processor in a power down state with state retention and resume operation almost immediately when an interrupt arrives. Operating system support is also available on all Cortex-M processors. However, it should be highlighted that unprivileged execution level and memory protection unit is not available for the Cortex-M0. There is also a difference in the level of fault exception handling. All Cortex-M, except the M0 and M0 Plus, support hard fault exception as well as three other types of fault exceptions. In addition, these cores have a fault syndrome register, which allows a fault handler to more accurately identify the reason behind a fault and potentially apply correct recovery procedure. This fault status register is not available on the Cortex-M0 and M0+. Plus. Hence, uh, most of the time, fault handling on the M0 and M0+, Plus would consist of resetting the processor. Uh, for the Cortex-M3, M4, and M7, uh, there is also a feature called bit banding, which essentially is uh, allowing um, two memory ranges, one in SRAM and one in the peripheral, to be bit addressable using an aliased address. Essentially what this is, is it allows for very efficient bit field operations on these Cortex-M processors. Now in terms of bus interfaces, all cores have a simple AHB light master, while on Cortex-M3, M4, and also M7, you have uh, an APB interface. Now on the Cortex-M7, because of its higher performance and operating frequency, an AXI interface is also present, as well as interfaces to tightly coupled fast memories. Additionally, Cortex-M7 supports up to 64 kilobyte each of instruction and data cache 
Again, this is because the Cortex-M7 is intended for a higher performance point and the cache are there to support uh, the higher operating frequencies. As far as the nested vector interrupt controller is concerned, um, Cortex-M0 and M0 Plus support up to 32 interrupts as well as the non-maskable interrupt while the Cortex-M3, M4, and M7 uh, can support up to 240 uh, interrupt sources as well as the non-maskable interrupt. Now in terms of interrupt priority levels, uh, the Cortex-M0 and Cortex-M0 Plus are based on the ARM V6M architecture and these two cores uh, can have up to four levels of programmable priority levels for their interrupts. The Cortex-M3, M4, and M7, on the other hand, are based on the ARM V7M architecture, and they can have anywhere between eight as a minimum, so eight levels minimum, up to 256 levels of priority of interrupts. Interrupt latency is one important aspect of an embedded processor performance. And the Cortex-M processors have very low interrupt rate latency, ranging from 12 uh, cycles in the Cortex-M3, M4, and M7, up to 16 cycles on the Cortex-M0. The difference is mainly due to the fact that this interrupt latency contains the stacking operation which pushes eight registers to the stack. And with a Harvard bus architecture, which is true for Cortex M0, M3, M4, and M7, uh, stacking and vector fetching as well as program fetching can be handled in parallel. Uh, please note that uh, interrupt latency figures in a real system can be uh, higher due to a weight state in memory systems and potentially also because of um, delay due to another interrupt service uh, being executed. Cortex-M performance considerations. Um, there are various ways to measure performance. One common and popular way is to use generic benchmarks such as CoreMark or DryStone. Um, however, it is important to note that generic benchmark performance might not be representative of the performance requirements for your application. So in many cases, using your own application code and running it on low-cost Cortex-M evaluation boards is a better way to gauge your performance requirements. Uh, in real applications, uh, Cortex-M3, M4, and M7 uh, are certainly faster than Cortex-M0, M0+, plus in a number of applications. Um, there might be some rare cases where some code is possibly faster on a Cortex-M0+, plus than a Cortex-M3. Those That, that can occur. Uh, however, it is probably rare because of the uh, richer instruction set uh, on the Cortex-M3 that, that we've gone through in the previous slides. So in general, if we look at the, uh, the performance uh, values here that are shown for, for standard benchmarks, we find that Cortex-M7 can reach five core marks per megahertz, which is very high, uh, and 2.14 dry stone per megahertz uh, in the official uh, test, which means there are no optimizations allowed. Um, and these values progressively decrease uh, as you, you go down uh, to the lower uh, Cortex-M processors in the family. Um, one thing to note is Cortex-M0 Plus uh, is a two-stage two pipeline um, processor while Cortex-M0, M3, and M4 are three-stage pipeline processors, and Cortex-M7 is a six-stage pipeline processor. Finally, 
I would like to summarize this webinar by presenting the types of target applications we see with each of the processor cores. The smallest Cortex-M0 in its minimal configuration occupying only 12K gates is widely used in applications such as touchscreen controllers as well as brushless motor controllers. The highly energy efficient Cortex-M0 Plus is very popular uh, in low power microcontrollers. We also see them being used in wireless Bluetooth uh, transceivers as well as IoT, uh, IoT node devices. The Cortex-M3 can be considered the standard 32-bit embedded processor today. It is widely used in many types of applications from smartwatches, smart meters, activity trackers, just to name a few. And the Cortex-M4 adds DSP performance uh, to the Cortex-M3 with, with its single cycle MAC instruction, saturation arithmetic, and an optional single precision floating point unit. We see Cortex-M4s running sensor fusion algorithms as well as audio processing. The Cortex-M7 is the latest member of the Cortex-M family and brings a big boost in performance, achieving five core marks per megahertz and up to two times the DSP performance of Cortex-M4. All this uh, with uh, upwards binary code compatibility. So I hope this webinar was able to shed some light on the differences as well as the commonality between the Cortex-M processors. For further information, there is a vast amount of data on Cortex-M processors you can find online. A good place to start is the ARM Connected Community website. I hope this webinar has been useful. Thank you.